Good morning, everybody. Thank you, as always, for joining us. And I'd always say at the beginning of these, I'm just giving a moment for everybody to join our virtual grand rounds. Hope everybody's having a great week. Um, I do want to next go to Dr. Shah, I believe you're with us as well, who's been updating on the Vote Health campaign. And again, we just wanted to send a reminder to pick up your uh, uh, badges that will uh, that will go a little reminder that will go on your badge. Dr. Shah, are you with us? Do anything you want to mention along those lines? Yeah, just um, just uh, to repeat that. Uh... Voter registration online ends this week, but uh, up until the day of, people can vote in person. And this is a prelude to really future elections too. Uh, the badges are opportunity to encourage patients, staff, um, ourselves, uh, reminding us that healthy democracies make for healthy communities. So um, please drop by uh, Grant S-102 if you'd like to get a badge. Also know that there is a, a dot phrase you can put into patient instructions if you'd like to, if it comes up and you want to explain to patients how they can most easily figure out how to register and where to vote. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Again, I appreciate your uh, uh, keeping us updated on that. Uh, next, I want to move over to uh, just state. I'm excited to announce that uh, just a few minutes ago, or actually maybe two minutes ago, we officially launched our 2022 uh, annual report. Uh, we've been doing these annual reports. We started in 2016, and we've done them every year. And this is year number seven. And I just want to say uh, a special thank you to the our communications team. We've had an ever-growing, really great and large communications team, uh, which now includes our directors of communication, Dr. Katie Kanagawa. Kanagawa. Um, I know she's here uh, lis listening on the uh, attendee side, so I just want to say a special thank you to her. Uh, the, the website was created by Jack Zhang and his team. We have a huge group of our communications team that's been growing thanks to uh, Kathy Garzio, who's helped grow this amazing team. And I'm looking forward to uh, us all meeting today at four o'clock. We're gonna invite a bunch of people who are part of this and in the story to uh, say more thank yous. But we're gonna send out in just a moment here, because I'm gonna send it right now, a, um, a chat with a link to this if you didn't get the email. Um, again, I just wanna say thank you to everybody for being part of this. And you know, the more that, this is our largest uh, annual report that we've done. Every year it's gotten larger and as we get, we incorporate more and more stories, all the great work that all you are doing. I worry more that we're missing things. Um, I, we did work with all the leadership throughout the department from the division chiefs to really just hearing from people individually as well to try to capture all the main stories. Uh, but please email me, please reach out and make sure I'm capturing all the great things that you're doing. Uh, and we wanna make sure we're promoting you, whether it's in the annual report, stated department that's upcoming in November or our weekly newsletters and stories that we'll do all the time and put on our website. So please let us know. Again, thank you to Dr. Harrington for all the great support he's provided for our communications since day one of the last nine years almost now. And uh, again, let me know if anything else we can do. So that's our annual report. I'm um, looking forward to hearing more from you about that. And uh, now moving on, I just wanna mention, um, actually, I want to mention a special thank you to Dr. Salas who helped set up today's Grand Rounds. We have a lot of great leaders in our department that help us cover these challenging topics from Dr. Salas to Dr. Dunn and Caceres and then Dr. Harmon as well. And I rely on them regularly for making Grand Rounds what it is. Um, they're a huge part of it. And this is one great example to be able to get amazing speakers like we have today. Thanks to their um, just uh, their input is, is tremendous. I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Salas. And again, thanks for helping set up today's uh, speaker. Of course, thank you so much, Errol. I just have uh, one quick announcement before we get to our guest speaker. Um, we are continuing our series of discussions about the 1619 podcast. So, so far we've discussed episodes one and two, and next week we'll be discussing episode three. Um, this is on October 24th at 5 p.m. If you scan this QR code, um, the one on the left will take you to the episode. The one on the slide um, to the right will take you to the registration link. I'll also put the registration link in the chat. So hopefully people uh, will be able to join us. This is virtual. Um, so should be relatively easy to jump in. And, and the episode I think is about 40 minutes. Um, so we just ask that you listen to that in advance. Um, with that, uh, I'd love to, oh. But yeah, thanks uh, for mentioning. Yeah, no problem. Mention our upcoming Grand Rounds. Uh, next week we have um, How Not to Die. Uh, I feel like don't we all die? But anyway, How Not to Die, <laughs> Preventing and Treating Disease with Diet um, by Dr. Michael. Um, and I'm, I apologize, I don't know this pronunciation. Grieger, Grieger, um, founder and chief science officer of nutritionfacts.org. Um, I think next slide, please. Okay, great. And so now um, it's 
really such an honor uh, to present to you, Dr. Colleen McNicholas. Dr. McNicholas is a graduate of the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine. She went on to complete her residency in obstetrics and gynecology um, and her fellowship in family planning and her master's of science in clinical investigation at Washington University of um, School of Medicine in St. Louis. She remained on faculty at Washington University serving in a variety of roles, including the director of uh, the Ryan Residency Program and the associate, associate director of the Fellowship of Family Planning until she very importantly then joined Planned Parenthood of the St. Louis region and Southwest Missouri as the first ever chief medical officer um, back in 2019. She continues to be active in clinical medicine and clinical research with uh, many peer reviewed publications. She has provided clinical care in four states across the Midwest and South. Dr. McNicholas believes that a physician's advocacy voice is as important as their clinical research or surgical skill. She has grown into an unapologetic and vocal advocate, engaging in every available medium. She has been the plaintiff to numerous challenges of state and federal laws and regulations. She has testified in the state capitol and in front of Congress in defense of patient-physician relationship and the importance of centering science and evidence in the creation of health policy. She's a member of the Gold Humanism Honor Society and has been recognized by a diversity of organizations for her leadership and advocacy. You may have seen her on uh, national news. She's been everywhere. Um, I don't know how she does it all, um, especially in the last um, couple of years and especially in the last you know, six to eight months. Um, she's really been a, a huge voice representing um, obstetricians, gynecologists, and patients who uh, need abortion care. So Dr. McNicholas, thank you so much for uh, joining us and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Let's see if I can uh, share my screen in a way that, okay. All right, I think that we have it. So thank you again for the kind introduction. It is quite an honor to be here and great to see some familiar faces um, in the crowd. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit today about public health. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about abortion and um, hopefully by the end of this, what we'll come across is the very important and pretty broad based intersection of abortion and public health. So I have some research funding totally unrelated to this topic, so not relevant, and maybe the most or least shocking statement I'll make all day today is that I am an abortion provider. And so obviously that influences the lens in which I um, approach this work. So from the earliest of civilizations, without perhaps the language of, or formal definition, societies have recognized and worked diligently towards the promotion of health and reduction of disease and what, what we now call public health. Um, starting as early as the aqueducts in ancient Roman civilization to the discovery in the 1800s that hand washing substantially reduced what was then called childbed fever, we now know as postpartum or peripartum infection. Um, perhaps not surprising to this crowd, uh, the, the physicians at the time were less than enthused uh, about the suggestion that their hand hygiene was what was causing so much morbidity um, in pregnant folks and had some real resistance to hand washing. And so now fast forward a couple hundred years and we are still stuck with direct observation from JCO on our hand hygiene because it turns out physicians are still not so great at washing their hands. Um, but all this to say, um, clearly public health, even before it was defined as such, was something that communities were um, interested in working towards. As we think about some of the most important public health initiatives or successes over time, I sort of like to think about them from first the global sense and then narrow it down to more domestic and then even local um, landscapes. And so starting by just looking super high level at um, some global initiatives and successes that we've had. Um, certainly, there have been many public health wins, um, sanitation and water safety, for example, major impacts on vaccine preventable disease. And I love that sort of our two announcements at the beginning were one about voting and two about <laughs> vaccination. So um, clearly a strong public health message there. The discovery of biologic germ theory and the development of precise therapeutics or HIV prevention are really just a few. And this certainly isn't intended to provide a ranking or you know, what I think are my top five public health advances, but really just to remind folks that public health from a very high level is so much more than just 
the management of a pandemic, although certainly in recent years, it's hard to forget that. Domestically, um, as I've noted, we share some of the same wins that the global public health community has um, has enjoyed. But there's been some other things too that that locally or domestically that we've been able to make some real public health um, movement on reduction in tobacco associated illness, for example, or motor vehicle safety. Um, one of the most important um, ways that morbidity and mortality in our roads has been impacted is by the addition of seatbelts and the requirement of child safety seats. And so right now you're probably thinking, what is she talking about? I thought we were going to talk about abortion. Um, and we are, but I really hope that I'm setting the stage to understand that abortion is going to intersect with so many areas of public health need. Um, some of the ones that you see on this slide here. So how does the US set public health goals? Um, well, since 1979, HHS has been using this healthy people framework. Um, Healthy People 2030 is the fifth iteration of that work and includes no fewer than 358, yes, 358 core and measurable public health outcomes that are priorities for the country. Um, that's a lot, obviously, um, but from that 385, they whittle down a subset of what they decide are their high priority areas or their leading health indicators. And I've pulled just a few here to give you an idea of what uh, the public health infrastructure in this country is, at least on paper, working towards. Some of these are not going to be surprising, like addressing drug overdose or suicide um, epidemics in the country. But others might spark some more curiosity, like reducing sugar consumption. Um, we might we could spend a whole another hour, and perhaps your next uh, week speaker will talk about. Um, how sugar became such an issue for public health in this country. Uh, the Cliff Notes version of that is it had to do with politics and lobbying, um, unsurprisingly. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's maybe one that folks weren't necessarily had high on their radar. Other pri high priority um, items on this list include some things that are less obvious, like um, increasing the number of kids that we have reading at grade level by fourth grade or impacting or, or evaluating what does the impact of stable employment look, look like for public health outcomes. So as you can see, it's a, it's a really broad understanding of public health. Um, and before we move into how and why abortion bans have created an evolving public health crisis, I think it's also important to define what a public health win is and what a public health crisis is. And it probably isn't surprising to some of you that there really isn't a single definition, um, which again, given the breadth and depth of the issues that our public health community tackles, that's not surprising. Having said that, I think in general, um, there's lots of agreement around some key concepts. A public health win is generally thought to be an intervention that strives to maximize healthy, thriving years of life. Um, and I specifically include the healthy, thriving part because that has also been an evolution over time. Many of our early measures around public health outcomes and successes focused on longevity or life expectancy, but not necessarily on quality of life. Um, and that's been a really a, a important addition over the last few years. The maximization of extension of a health or extension of healthy, thriving lives um, is accompanied or accomplished through prevention, prevention of disease, disability, injury, or premature death. And that's one way that um, oftentimes the public health framework differs from the medicine or clinician framework, that it really truly is about prevention and for the whole community, not just the patient sitting in front of us. And increasingly and appropriately and importantly, we are seeing an overlay of an equity lens and prioritizing those interventions around the most marginalized and the most impacted. And so if this is how we define a public health win, how are we gonna define a public health crisis? So the flip side of that win is really um, the best way I like to describe it and the way that I have been um, communicating this to the administration. Um, some of you may know that when the Dobbs decision was handed down, I happened to be sitting in a room with um, Secretary uh, Javier Becerra talking about the implications of abortion bans and how I really felt like it was going to be a public health crisis that, um, that ensued. And the way that I framed that for, for him, and I continue to do so for, for the both local and, and national administration, is that when 
Um, if the consequences of a precipitating event or events, um, when considering the scale of the event, the timing of the event, and the preparation of the systems, if the, the combination of those things overwhelm the routine community capabilities or infrastructure to address the issue, then that is the moment that we should decide that this is actually truly a public health crisis. And I would argue that the precipitating event um, was not necessarily June 24th when the SCOTUS dismantled the federal protection to abortion in the Dobbs decision. It actually um, started many, many years ago, uh, particularly in states like Missouri, where states had been chipping away at access through individual state laws and regulations for years. And in fact, states like Missouri, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, all the states who have now moved to ban or really further restrict abortion, many of those have been living in what we call a post-Roe reality for many years. Okay, so we are about to talk about um, some, you know, backsliding that we have seen in the recent days and years around the public health winds of abortion access. Um, and I put this slide up really just as a reminder that abortion isn't the only pu public health win that we have seen some um, some reverse, some reversal on. So you don't have to look any further than Flint, Michigan or Jackson, Mississippi, or really the many water safety um, and sanitation issues that are happening across the country to know that without diligent attention um, and participation from a broad spectrum of stakeholders, it's really quite easy for many of our uh, public health winds to, to slide back to a place of crisis or danger. But um, having said that, the fact that folks are listening and paying attention, voting and um, discussing these issues means that we will make our way back forward um, to a better place. All right, so let's transition now that we have sort of the larger framework um, of public health, at least how I see it, I'm gonna start working my way through how I see that intersection with abortion access and abortion bans and public health. So let's start again from the very high level and talk about global trends. <clears throat> so globally, the past 50 years have can, can be described really unmistakably as moving towards liberalization of abortion laws. Um, the WHO estimates that annually about 73 million abortions take place worldwide. That's about 39 abortions per 1,000 women. And that rate uh, has largely been unchanged since the 1990s. Since 2000, you can see um, from this uh, graph that at least 38 countries have moved towards liberalization, with some of the more notable evolutions being the, the referendum in 2018 in Ireland, or even more recently, some wins in liberalization in, in Argentina, two countries that could arguably, arguably be described as fairly conservative or very religiously rooted. Some of these really important wins across the globe have been because the message has centered public health um, and that the, the healthcare system has seen for so long so many of the consequences um, of having unsafe abortion and inaccessible abortion. On the flip side, there have only been two countries in the same time that have moved towards criminalization. And of course, we are now one of them, um, joined by Nicaragua. So what is the state of the states? And I can tell you that over the last two months, um, I have changed this graph no more than probably two dozen times because there are so many cases that are constantly being litigated, so many laws that are being put into effect and, and then enjoined. And so um, this may not be precisely accurate as of this moment, but it is generally a good um, description of what's happening in this, in this country. So the states that are bright pink, um, those are states that are enforcing a total ban. And so you can see that there's a very large consolidated area across the country where there is no access, no meaningful access to abortion care. Now our affiliate serves Missouri, which obviously is ban a banned state, but we also have a um, clinic in Southern Illinois just across the border. And so we have the unique opportunity and lens to understand what it's like to be existing in a state where abortion is banned, but also in a state where we are absorbing so many of the folks who are now traveling from those states that you see there. The lighter peak, pink states are places where there are more restrictions, but not a total loss of access. For example, Georgia has a six-week ban in place. Florida has a 15-week ban in place. 
And then as you get to the white states, those are places where there's more access and blue states are places where we have pretty good access right now. Um, the yellow states are just yellow because they truly day to day at this point are um, in such frequent um, litigation and, and change in status that um, I stopped change, changing them on the map for, for now at least. So what is the impact of you know, almost half of the country there losing access to abortion? Well, what we know is that 17 states currently and a projected up to 26 states will completely lose abortion access or will have abortion access so severely restricted that it's not available to most people. That's gonna affect up to 26 million people of reproductive capabilities. And we've already seen just in the months since the Dobbs decision that 66 clinics that were providing abortion services have stopped doing so. And maybe more importantly, at least a third of those have had to close altogether. And the reason that that is so essential and critical to understand is because many of the country's abortion clinics are also communities only provider of reliable full spectrum contraceptive services and STI testing and screening um, and treatment. And so when we think about the compounding public health crises that can result from abortion bans, we can't forget about other areas um, that abortion clinics oftentimes serve like contraceptive access, um, gender affirming care and sexually transmitted infection care. So I can spend lots and lots and lots of time going through that 385 key priorities that uh, Healthy People 2030 have laid out. And this is just a couple of the ones that I pulled out that I can very easily make an argument for the intersection of abortion and those issues. We've heard, for example, we know that, for example, um, access to reliable medication is um, one of the key public health priorities um, for HHS in this uh, Healthy People's version. Well, you have all heard and may have even seen that folks are having tremendous difficulty accessing medication unrelated to abortion, but medication that may potentially be used in some abortion instances, methotrexate, for example, to treat their chronic non-obstetric related diseases. And so that's one example of how abortion bans are already impacting the care that we're providing well outside of obstetrics and gynecologic care. Public safety might also be another one where folks are scratching their head a little bit. Well, those of us who provide abortion care um, can tell you that the number of times we interact with law enforcement, for example, to maintain chain of custody for tissue um, testing in the case of sexual assault and rape is not uncommon. And for those of us in states now like Illinois who are absorbing so many folks coming from the states below us, we have public safety uh, law enforcement officers, investigators in our clinic almost every single day now, um, which is um, certainly a phenomenon that we had not seen with this frequency before. Okay, so let's move to some of the more obvious impacts that abortion bans will have on, um, on public health outcomes. Maternal morbidity mortality, we'll talk about some of the changing trends that we're already seeing in abortion care and the impact on workforce. So the liberalization of abortion laws really began in the 1950s with states like New York and California leading the way. Seems like California is frequently leading the way for us in many ways. Um, with liberalization and legalization came the opportunity to collect and analyze data. And what you're looking at here are the attributable deaths to legal abortion. Um, we are certainly all aware that unsafe abortion was uh, the cause and continues globally to be a cause of much morbidity and mortality. Um, but it's difficult to have any reliable or consistent accurate data to estimate the impact of, of illegal practices. And so I'm gonna leave that for now. What you can see though, is that um, within that first decade following liberalization, even legal abortion became much safer. And that was because techniques were refined, hospital-based services became more available, and there was a trained workforce to safely deliver the care. In the early 1970s, um, there were, so in 1972, there were 35 reported deaths as a, reported as related to legal abortion. And 19, by 1973, that was down to 19. And that for the time translated to a rate of about 2.1 maternal deaths per 100,000 legal abortions. 
In the most recent decades, um, for as long as I've been alive, the rate has been exceedingly low um, at about 0.4 deaths per 100,000 legal abortions. And so on average, we see about in this country one death, um, one to two deaths per year uh, attributed to legal abortion. And it's important to note and contrast that with what our maternal mortality rates are in this country. And so the most recent data um, suggests that our maternal mortality rate is 23.8 per 100,000 births. And we know that the most marginalized folks, black and brown communities have a much higher rate of maternal mortality at about 55 per 100,000. So despite being one of the most advanced countries with some of the best technology, um, we continue to lead the developed world in um, rates of maternal mortality and, and morbidity. It's important to know that there are lots of overlays here. So this is the, what you see here are the 10 states with the worst rates for maternal mortality. My home state, well actually my home state is Illinois, but I've lived in Missouri since training. So I'll, I'll say my home state of Missouri. Uh, ranks 44th with a maternal mortality rate of 34.6. And for our Black pregnant and birthing population, it's almost 100 um, folks dying per year uh, per 100,000 um, folks who are delivering. So this is a really important point to make here. Aside from New Jersey, um, these are all states that have moved to ban or severely restrict abortion. And this is not a coincidence. When we're talking about maternal mortality, it's also really important um, that we don't forget the morbidity component. In 2020, there were 850 reported maternal deaths. And for each maternal death, it was estimated that there were at least 70 serious morbidity events. Serious morbidity events were defined as requiring a life-saving intervention, some of which were um, included there in the picture. So we're now at a point where we're reducing access to abortion. Um, and the natural consequence of that, of course, is that more folks will stay pregnant for longer, which means more people will have serious pregnancy related events. And some of those profound consequences or those serious morbidity events will change life expectancy and quality of life for both them and their families. Now let's take that in the context of some news that was published just this week, which is the reality um, of a, a, another obstetric public health crisis, and that's increasing swaths of the country losing access to obstetric and prenatal care. So we have less healthy younger populations um, with similar or even increased rates of unintended pregnancy in the years to come without access to abortion in places where they also don't have reliable obstetric or prenatal care. Clearly, this is not setting us up for some good public health outcomes. And look, if we look at these, again, look at these states that have maternity deserts, they are overlaying the folks who have already banned or are poised to ban abortion access entirely, setting us up for some real detrimental public health changes. So despite it only have been a Having only been a couple of months, um, there is some data already coming out. So researchers, researchers out of the University of Colorado have done some early modeling using pregnancy and abortion rates in banned states to estimate the numbers who would not be able to access abortion outside of their banned states and extrapolating maternal mortality data um, to estimate what we expect to see in the first year post jobs. And so what the data suggests is that for all comers, we expect to see an increase of about 13% in maternal mortality for all comers. And when you narrow that to black and brown birthing populations, we see an increase of 18%. When they take that modeling and extrapolate it out for year two and beyond, we see that estimates reach as high as an increase of 40% in, in black maternal mortality. And so um, although this is certainly not a perfect estimate or modeling, um, and we all understand the, um, the liabilities of this kind of um, data, um, certainly we have some things that we need to be paying attention to and trying to mitigate. So the increase in maternal mortality in and of itself is tragic and worthy of urgent intervention. Um, however, it's not the only evolving aspect of the crisis. Some of the, re the early successful interventions in legal abortion care came um, or that led to, to reduced morbidity and mortality are also poised to be lost. Uh, accessibility drove gestational age um, for folks presenting for care 
dramatically down and most folks were presenting for care very early in pregnancy. Um, as I mentioned, it created a workforce, a trained workforce who specialized in abortion care, who could provide the safest techniques based on the sound, soundest scientific evidence. And although um, it's been limited in many states, um, Missouri included, the availability of hospital-based abortion care has been increasingly important as we know that our general, the general health of our population um, in the reproductive years has been getting um, less and less healthy. So we're talking about the sickest folks, people with comorbidities like heart failure, cancer, bleeding disorders, pulmonary hypertension, the folks that you are taking care of who it probably gives you um, a bit of a palpitation to uh, when they roll into your office with their positive pregnancy test. Um, there was a safe place for those folks to have optimization of their medical condition um, to manage their pregnancy or their abo abortion care. And that no longer exists for most of the country. In 2018, the National Academies of Sciences and Engineering and Medicine completed what I think is probably the most robust assessment um, on the safety of abortion and the safety of abortion care. Um, it's a great and quite lengthy read, uh, so I recommend a warm fire and a cup of coffee or maybe a bourbon if that's your preference. Um, uh, when you sit down to read through the whole thing, but I'll give you the, the short version. I think there were three really important findings um, from that study that we have already seen um, impacts in, in this post-Dobbs world. The first is that it um, clearly stated that the safety of abortion depended on where you live. Um, and that was well before this decision. And so even before we were facing a reality where half the country lost access to abortion, we were already acknowledging that where you lived um, really strongly influenced how safe abortion could be for you. It also said that abortion restrictions themselves are barriers to safe care. And in fact, it is abortion restrictions and bans that make uh, pregnancy termination less safe. And then the last thing um, I will lift out for folks is that the safety of abortion is also related to when folks are having abortion. So we know that abortion is safest early in pregnancy. So what have we seen um, in terms of abortion rates over the last few years? Um, and particularly, what is the impact then on gestational age? So it has been true for so many years up until the most recent data that the trends in abortion rates have been declining. And there's lots of reasons that abortion rates and the need for abortion has been declining over time, uh, mostly I think attributable to the accessibility of uh, contraception, reliable contraception. That changed in 2020 where we saw the first uptick of rates of abortion in this country in a very long time. Now I could postulate why that is. Um, I think we certainly heard from folks that um, the pandemic influenced their decision to um, decide to parent or expand their family in profound ways, sometimes because the person who was their caregiver, grandma, for example, um, may have passed away from COVID-related infection or folks um, lost their job or they were afraid to be in the hospital where we were treating folks with profound, uh, profound COVID-related um, illness. And so um, we are starting to see, again, an uptick in the folks who are needing um, abortion care. We haven't yet seen in the data um, a change in the distribution of folks seeking care um, at what gestational age. So for a long time, the vast majority of folks seeking abortion did so in the first trimester. So more than 90% of folks um, were able to access their abortion at less than 13 weeks. A smaller percentage, about 6% of folks were accessing care between 14 and 20 weeks. And despite the fact that the national narrative often focuses on the folks who are having um, and seeking abortion beyond 21 weeks, it really um, accounts for such a minority of the folks who are accessing abortion um, in this country, or at least it has historically. In the three months um, since the Dobbs decision, so when we looked at our own data in Southern Illinois, um, in the three months before the Dobbs decision and compared it to now the three months since the Dobbs decision, we have already seen a 200% increase in the patients that we are seeing in the second trimester. And that has happening for a variety of reasons. I'm showing my age here now with my real world uh, <laughs> um, decal here. Um, but I'm gonna give you an example. I'll tell you a patient story um, that uh, I think really demonstrates what we have already started to see and what we will continue to see. 
So shortly after the Dobbs decision, we saw a patient from Louisiana. Her clinical presentation was that she had irregular periods. She realized she was pregnant at what she thought was about 10 weeks of pregnancy. Um, in Louisiana, abortion was already banned. She made an initial appointment in Florida um, that was a manageable driving distance for her. She presented for her visit and was found to be a little over 15 weeks. Um, Florida had already implemented its 15 week ban. So she was denied abortion care at that point. She had to return to Louisiana and figure out um, how she would then um, get additional care. She was told in Florida that as the gestational age increases, so too does the cost of the procedure. And so she decided she would wait until her next paycheck before she sought out care so that she could pay for that care when she made the appointment. So she waited two weeks that now made her 17 weeks before she called our clinic. She then found out that because of the fact that we are absorbing so many patients, our wait time is now two to three weeks. And so she wasn't able to actually have an appointment until she was now 20 weeks pregnant. And so what started as pregnancy identified somewhere between 10 and 15 weeks became a procedure that happened at 20 weeks, um, many miles away from, from her home. These are the stories that we continue to see day in and day out. I will say that immediately after the Dobbs decision, clinics like ourselves have already made operational changes to try and absorb some of those patients. So we've changed our operating procedures um, to now be 10 hours a day, uh, six days a week, and we do one Sunday a month. And despite adding what is the equivalent of approximately two additional days of services um, a week, uh, we um, have not been able to budge the, the wait times. Um, we are still looking at wait times of two to three weeks despite being able to, to add more slots. So what about training? So we talked about the workforce being a, a trained and skilled workforce being a really important component to reducing the morbidity and mortality related to abortion-related care. Well, what we know is that right now, 44% of OBGYN residents are training in a state where abortion is now banned. Um, and many of the impending um, legislative attacks on abortion care that we expect to see will target folks leaving the state for either uh, ability to access that care themselves or to train or provide that care. And so we really are facing a crisis in the training of obstetrics, particularly in obstetrics and gynecologic uh, workforce around being competent and capable of providing this care. As many of you know, um, you know, the techniques of abortion care, particularly abortion later in pregnancy, translate very well uh, in our important skills in the treatment in, of emergent obstetric um, issues. So around the time of Roe, when hospital um, availability became more available and there was an increasing workforce that was trained in providing um, procedures like a dilation and evacuation, the number of, for example, hysterectomies and hysterotomies, major abdominal surgery related to obstetric um, emergencies went down dramatically. We will likely see a return to a time uh, where folks are having unnecessary major abdominal surgery as a consequence of obstetric emergency because there are no trained providers. And then I would say one of the things that um, I really worry about as a loss um, for our training and, and future workforce is um, learning the therapeutics of empathy. Um, so, you know, at WashU, abortion was an integral uh, part of their training, and certainly not everybody went on to, to be an abortion provider. But one of the things I think that trainees learn is um, and experience is by sitting with folks who need abortion care, um, hearing their stories and understanding um, the complicated and intersecting ways in which life leads them to that um, healthcare decision, really, I think, creates um, a workforce of physicians that um, are more able to help folks through those, through those difficult decisions um, and to be able to refer them and understand and advocate for accessibility of the procedure. Okay, so we talked about some of what, what, are, what we're likely to you, the obvious impacts on public health. Um, but now I'm gonna switch to a couple of different options, um, a, a couple of different public health issues that maybe are not so obvious to folks in how they intersect with, with abortion. So for a very long time, poverty has been identified as a public health issue. And that of course is not surprising to folks. 
Um, the U.S. has one of the highest rates of poverty among developed nations, despite the collective wealth that we have in this country. Um, and in addition to comparative data on poverty rates as a single metric, the U.S. also leads other developed nation in having the worst index of health and social problems as a function of income inequality. So um, many are aware of the longstanding data that demonstrates, um, as this graph shows, that life expectancy is significantly impacted by household income. But with moves towards um, understanding some of our toughest issues with a more intersectional and health equitable lens, uh, we've also seen the definition of poverty broaden over the years. And I can tell you that for those of us that um, provide abortion, each of these components, whether it's income, general financial stability, housing security, educational opportunities, or just general access to health care, are all things that our patients are citing for the reasons why they're seeking abortion care. You may have seen on the news just yesterday that a school district in my community, just 15 miles from where my child goes to school, um, announced that there were unsafe levels of radioactive material found in the classroom, cafeteria, and library, and now that school is closing. And so um, all that to say, um, there's so much intersection between these, these different areas. So what else do we know about the intersection of abortion and poverty? Um, this is also probably not surprising to folks. But when we look at the demographics of those who are seeking abortion, um, we see that 75% of those who are having abortion report being poor or low income. And for those of you who are not um, entrenched with federal poverty lines, um, a, metrics, a metric that's used to determine eligibility for many publicly funded programs, um, the designation of poor translates to an annual income of $18,000 a year for a family of two. And low income would be uh, an annual income of $36,000 for a family of two. So 75% of the people who are seeking abortion are caring for themselves and likely a child already um, making less than $36,000 a year and in some cases less than $18,000 a year. And so this clearly demonstrates the link between poverty and abortion and the overlay of those two. We also know there's some well-established data um, really that came in the, in the years following the Roe decision to, to show that um, accessibility of abortion has contributed to the reduced rates of not only teen birth, but also of teen marriage. Um, it's also positively contributed to higher levels of educational attainment and workforce participation for women. Of course, obviously, these benefits ultimately trickle down to the children and the families that they eventually create. And some of the more recent data, um, again, coming out of the Institute for Economics um, published by Caitlin Myers indicated that um, for every 100 additional travel miles that are required for patients seeking abortion, about 20% of those folks will not be able to, um, to actually access that care. So we're talking about 20% of those folks then um, being disadvantaged and, and being denied an opportunity to potentially break those bonds and, and chains of poverty that they are um, currently living in. So what does this mean for the overall economy? economy? So this is actually um, some data from the Institute for Women's Policy Research, and they have an interactive map. It's really great. You can click on states and find all sorts of impact of abortion restriction data on um, larger um, economic metrics. So um, this shows that uh, esti estimated economic loss as a result of abortion restrictions or bans in the state um, for California is estimated to be $5.5 billion. And for Missouri right now, it's $5.3 billion. And uh, so this is, you know, California is a state where abortion was blue, right? It's incredibly, um, for, for lots of folks, it is um, much more accessible than in other places. But still, despite that, the existing regulation around abortion continues to have economic impact. And, the, and if all restrictions were eliminated for Missouri, um, we would see an increase in GDP of more than 1% and an increase in the labor force of almost 2%. And so not only does abortion impact poverty on the individual level, but it also does so on a community and statewide level. Um, when we look at these same metrics from the country level, it's estimated that the US private sector could see earning growth of more than 9% if abortion restrictions and bans were eliminated. 
Okay, so here's my real words, world story um, to, to demonstrate the effect of um, poverty's intersection with, with abortion. So um, we saw a patient recently from Mississippi, <clears throat> and this patient had a medical comorbidity. She had stable heart failure, and to her, stable heart failure didn't was, it was something that um, because she was stable, didn't have any change in her medications for some time, her activity of daily life was, was manageable. Um, she didn't think to tell us about that prior to her presenting for care. And so she presented for care in the outpatient setting, um, at which point evaluation determined that um, she would be best suited for hospital-based care, that it probably wasn't safe for her to have um, a second trimester abortion with us in the outpatient setting. Um, unfortunately, in Southern Illinois, there is no close hospital-based uh, abortion care. And so we quickly uh, pivoted to being able to get this patient to Chicago. And so after much to do um, in arranging for her transportation from Southern Illinois to Chicago, arranging for her care in a hospital-based setting and figuring out the financial component of paying for that care, um, she asked for a moment uh, of clarity and she said, so what you're saying is that if I don't go to Chicago today for this abortion, then I, then I can't have an abortion. Um, and I said, yes, unfortunately, I think the only safe place for you to have this is in the hospital. And she said, okay, um, you know, I'm going to call my job. She called, she got off the phone and said, well, I just lost my job because I was only able to negotiate, um, one day off of work. And I was hoping to be able to get back to work tomorrow. This, again, is something we hear over and over again as folks um, realize that the evolution of their care means not just one day, but two days or three days, and not just um, one trip, but potentially two or three trips um, and, and, and really needing to navigate multiple days off of work. Okay, violence. Violence is also a public health, health issue, and, and that is, again, not a surprise. But how does that intersect with abortion? Um, so what we know is that half of all women have experienced sexual violence, and one in four folks have been a victim of attempted or completed rape. Um, we also know that homicide is the number one cause of death in pregnancy, and that for folks who experience an unintended pregnancy, they are two to four times more likely to experience physical violence. Some recent data suggests that somewhere between 6 and 22% of um, survivors report intimate partner violence as a primary reason for their abortion. And 34% of those survivors report re reproductive coercion as part of their abuse. And so we know that violence, um, particularly interpartner uh, violence um, and sexual assault, are intimately tied with abortion and abortion access. Um, very quickly um, after the Dobbs decision came down, um, we saw a patient from Arkansas who um, was partnered with one of our case managers. Um, we rolled out some efforts to manage the logistics for folks. Um, our experience in Missouri told us that um, having availability and appointments in Illinois wasn't going to be enough and that we had to really focus our energy on getting them there. And so we started what was called the Regional Logistics Center, which is truly a 24 hours a day case management system where folks coming to the region are paired with a case manager to navigate those logistics. This patient um, called her case manager at two in the morning to ask her to rearrange her uh, ride share to the airport. Um, so when uh, asking a little bit more about that, the patient said, well, he's gone. This is the only safe time that I can leave the house. And so we did, we did that. We re rearranged her ride share. She got to the airport eight hours before her flight, but was able to get to us safely and have an uncomplicated procedure. She then went back to the hotel where she called her case manager again and with tears um, said she wasn't going to make her flight home. And so the case manager, of course, doing what our social workers and case managers do so well, um, tried to, to help sort of dissect that. Do you need us to change your flight? Is everything okay? Are you not feeling well? And the patient simply said, look, all I have is the clothes on my back, but this is my only opportunity to, to get away from him. And so I'm just not going back. Um, and so for this patient, her abortion was an opportunity for her um, to escape a long history of violence um, in her relationship. So the anecdotes that I'm sharing are not necessarily um, just anecdotes. Folks who are providing abortion care have lots of these stories. Um, there's also a consolidated now um, com uh, compilation of 
what was more than 50 publications um, from the Turnaway study. Um, Turnaway study followed 1,000 women over 21 states for 10 years and looked at some of these very markers that we are talking about, some of these really important public health outcomes and how they intersected with folks either being able to secure their abortion or being denied their abortion. And what they found was exactly what we've been talking about, that there are significant economic impacts, health impacts, um, impacts on, on violence and healthy relationships and trickle down impacts on the health and, and security of the family unit. I'm going to end with this one last um, public health measure um, that I am personally keeping a very close eye on, and that's transportation safety. Um, and this may be the least obvious of all of the things that we've talked about, but abortion, um, especially in this post Dobbs era, is definitely going to become a, a transportation safety issue. So um, it is um, routine. In fact, it is daily that we have folks tell us that they got in their car um, from Houston, Texas at one in the morning. They drove 838 miles to get to us, um, nine and 10 hours. They took their medication abortion with us. They get right back in the car and drive those nine, 10, 12, 14 hours back home. And so we now have an entire cohort of healthcare seekers who are um, spending entire days on the road driving to and from their appointments. And this is in the context of a fairly robust case management system where we offer folks the availability to stay overnight. We help them find hotel rooms. But what we continue to hear um, patient after patient is that um, they can't do it, that they have somebody at home watching their kid, that they have to be back to work by tomorrow. And so we are now facing a reality where uh, safety on our roads is also likely to be impacted by abortion bans. Um, my real world story is um, again, just similar to what, to, to what I just shared. We saw a patient from um, Houston who got in her car at 2 a.m., drove 14 hours um, to get to us. and. Uh, during her one hour visit with us, slept in the, in the clinic, um, had her abortion visit with us and then got right back in the car. And I can't tell you the number of patients who um, share that same story and, and that we worry about getting back on the road um, and, and the number of motor vehicle accidents and traumas that will occur as a, as a consequence of this. So I'm gonna stop there. Obviously, you know, all of the things on this slide and many more things um, folks are well aware are public health issues and deserving of our attention. Um, but I hope now too that you understand that abortion access impacts these, these things really profoundly, not just on the individual level, but also more broadly um, for the community and the country. So I'm happy to take questions. Again, I appreciate the time and it certainly was an honor to be here with you today. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. McNicholas, for such a, a really provocative and impactful um, presentation, including, I really love the, the real world um, examples that you shared that are just heartbreaking. And I, and I can't imagine, I mean, I have a hard time imagining what it must be like to sit in your shoes and hear those stories day after day. So thank you for doing that really important work. Um, I'm going to go uh, very quickly to uh, Dr. Subak, who is the chair of obstetrics and gynecology here uh, for a comment or question. Yeah. Um, Colleen, actually, I just I want to make a comment also. I think especially for this very broad audience, bringing the stories of the, the atrocity of what's happened um, with the Dobbs decision is really important for each of us to carry this with us and do the work we can um, to, to try to um, to try to reverse this. Um, thank you so much for your work that's making such a difference for thousands and thousands of women. Um, we will all look to you and follow you for how we can be helping more. And I, I'll turn it over to people who have questions. Thank you for that, Dr. Subak, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Dr. Shaw, who is um, a, also a faculty member here in uh, obstetrics and gynecology. Thanks. Thanks for your wonderful presentation. It's so nice to have you and, and hear everything that you're doing and this great uh, framework of the public health. You're doing so much already in Illinois, even prior, as you highlighted, pre-Dobbs um, and even pre-Texas and Oklahoma bans. Um, in California, we, we definitely feel like we're in a bubble and a little bit of a 
um, kind of a Disneyland of, of abortion care. And um, I, we often hear, what can we do here to help um, elsewhere? So I'd love for you to just uh, help provide that. What can people be doing to, to help support abortion care across the country? Thanks so much, Kate, and it's great to see you. Uh, uh, and thanks for lifting that. Um, you know, I, I will start by saying that um, although certainly California does provide lots of um, uh, access to folks, there are certainly still places in California where it's difficult to access care. So I would say, um, you know, not necessarily even looking to other places, but what can you do locally um, to help continue to secure access. Um, one of the most important things I think we can do is continue to normalize abortion. And so however that looks in your practice and in your family and in your community, um, I encourage folks to do that. So um, talking about abortion, talking about the impact of abortion is really important. Um, as physicians and clinicians who are seeing um, non-obstetric patients, um, you know, I would say collecting those stories when a pregnancy does impact the the management of chronic medical conditions um, is, is really important. Um, many of the persuadable, persuadable um, policymakers are more impacted when non-abortion providers share stories. Um, they know what they're going to hear from me, but when they hear from an oncologist that somebody's cancer care was significantly delayed, or when um, a child's previously stable rheumatoid arthritis is no longer stable and they can't access those medications, those stories make such a profound impact um, in ways that uh, abortion providers just can't make anymore. Um, and so I would say continue to, to use those stories and lift those stories for folks. Thank you, uh, Dr. McNichols. Do, are you able to stay just a couple minutes over? Yes. Awesome. We have, we have so many questions. I might just try to sneak in a couple more um, before sure. we end. Um, there is a question here from the audience asking about, you know, this uh, excellent framing that you did around various public health issues like poverty and um, other issues that intersect with abortion care. Uh, the question is, are you finding or how effective are you finding those arguments to be for policymakers? Well, I will say that, um, you know, while the um, anti-abortion extremists had been spending decades um, sowing distrust in public health and science generally, we are now seeing the, the sort of skill they gained in focusing solely on abortion in other spaces, right? So we know that, I mean, you can look at the policy uh, policies around the pandemic and masking and, and vaccination, right, to know that um, we have a lot of work to do with particularly elected officials to, um, to bring back the public health framing as something that they prioritize and that they value. Um, so have I been successful yet? Not really. <laughs> Um, but I do think it is a way to broaden who is doing the advocacy, right? And so um, it's a way for us to bring in folks who maybe don't feel very close to abortion care or who feel very nervous about talking about abortion care um, and to, to help sort of give folks some other way to talk about um, how abortion um, or why abortion access is um, important. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think if we go back in time, uh, six months, eight months, maybe a year, m many people who um, are not as well versed on abortion care and the state of abortion in the United States um, just started realizing that we were about to potentially lose this access. And I don't know, I'm sure there's more that we could have done at that time to try to prevent what has happened, but sitting where we are now, and knowing that there is there are efforts toward federal a federal ban on abortion, are there things or what would you recommend that we all and other people who want to secure access effort to abortion care for as long as possible for as many people as possible? Like, what are actions we should be taking now before we get to the point of a, a federal ban? Well, the first thing I will say, and again, I'll, I'll reference sort of the start of um, your announcements today is vote um, and pay attention to even the most local 
level officials, your school boards and your county councils, um, because the dismantling of abortion access really starts super local. Um, and we're going to have to, in order to, to build legislatures like in Missouri, where we have um, folks who understand the public health implications of abortion bans, we really are going to have to create that pipeline of folks that get back up to the legislator. And so paying attention to local um, local races and making sure that you're you're voting. Um, you know, I would say we made a lot, we collectively made a lot of um, bad decisions on in the last since Roe around how we were protecting and defending abortion access, who was doing that work, um, how we allowed it as um, in medicine to be siloed as something other than healthcare. Um, but the truth is, we can't change any of that. So, you know, we now need to just take this opportunity to do something different and do something bold and innovative. Um, I would say for, especially, um, you know, in California, you guys have lots of opportunity to do innovative things and bold things. And certainly the governor has supported lots of um, uh, policies um, to that degree. And so I would say continue, you know, thinking outside of the box um, when you're thinking about what those, those interventions could be. Um, and then I, you know, again, I think the, the last thing is when we when we build back the system where um, abortion access is available, it really has to be in, in, in a context where we understand um, the intersecting nature of people's lives and how they come to abortion care and really centering equity and justice, right? So it has to be accessible for the most marginalized and the most impactful where they live, um, not just in, you know, our big cities, um, not just for folks who are insured, um, it has to be available for everybody. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, I'm just going to tie together two other things as we are last question, um, two other comments and questions from the audience. Um, so they're, and I think they're related. So one is, um, there are people who are physicians or, or uh, advanced practice, uh, or advanced practitioners who, um, may want to, who are not trained in abortion care, who are not in obstetrics and gynecology, who, um, Kit have interest in helping to kind of relieve some of the burden um, of, of this increased volume in certain areas. What are your thoughts on, on that? People who are not uh, obstetricians or gynecologists are trained in obstetrics and gynecology taking on some of that work and related, could that be through telemedicine so that people who practice, for example, in California, could mm -hmm. see some of the patients that you're seeing um, in uh, Missouri or in Illinois? Yes, great questions. And absolutely, yes, we can certainly expand the pool of providers, particularly for medication abortion. We know that medication abortion is one of the safest uh, interventions we have in medicine as a whole, and it is certainly safe um, for early pregnancy termination. Um, one of the really important advocacy and policy um, initiatives that we are working on is directed at the FDA. The FDA still maintains some um, restriction around uh, the prescribing of mifepristone. Um, and so we are working really closely um, with some advocacy groups to try and get rid of those last remaining um, restrictions. Medication abortion is incredibly easy to learn how to do. Um, and certainly we utilize, we have a ton of advanced practice clinicians who are excellent abortion providers with us in Illinois. And I know you all do as well um, in California, but it doesn't even have to be, you know, we have some ER physicians and family medicine doctors. Um, it really is a, um, a service line that is easy to, to learn. And I bet Kate can help folks figure out how to become um, mifepristone prescribers and give some folks some information about um, um, how to how to do that? And do you think telemedicine absolutely relieves the, some of this um, burden in certain areas? Because as you showed in your map, it's yeah. like a swath of, of the the country where people can't easily pop over just one state necessarily, even which is already hard enough if they could do that. But people are are having to potentially go, as you mentioned, very long distances. Telemedicine can be and hopefully will eventually be a critical component of reducing the burden. Um, telemedicine is also tricky right now because telemedicine laws are regulated by state, not federally. And so another 
another good advocacy opportunity that is a little removed from direct abortion access would be to advocate for some federal DHHS regulation and, and policy, some guidance around um, telemedicine, for example. And you don't even have to say the word abortion. You can just advocate for the availability of telehealth regulation at a federal level instead of on a state level, which then would really provide opportunity. Right now, for example, we do provide telemedicine abortion um, out of Illinois, but patients have to drive across the border into Illinois to take that um, telehealth appointment. Um, and so it, although for some folks, it might decrease your travel from 800 miles to 500 miles, um, it still isn't at, we're not utilizing it um, as best we can right now. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing that insight. And, and thank you so much for, I'm so sorry, we went mi several minutes over. Thank you so much for your time and, and importantly for all the work that you're doing, um, both locally there, but also nationally to raise awareness and to advocate for the care that really everyone should have access to, because as this background says, abortion is healthcare. Um, so thank you to everybody for being here and um, everybody have a lovely day. We'll keep on fighting this fight. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.